Hi, now we're talking about evaluating your audience and the overall situation in the room when you're making a speech. So here are some general questions that occur to us first before we make our speech. What does the audience know about my topic? Is this something completely new or is this something familiar? How do they feel about this? Is it um, a debate? Is it a public debate that I'm going to explore and how can I best reach my audience members each of them how can I speak with them honestly and directly these are some of the concerns that come up first and when you're choosing your topic especially your informative topic you may want to pick a, um, an item that is unknown and fresh and then you would have to think about methods of introducing new information so the demographics of your audience will play a role and in your case again the demographic is your classmates um, but of course they can be of different ages uh, genders uh, levels at school uh, when it's a broader audience in the community or elsewhere they have different educational levels and they belong to different groups as a, as a speaker, as a teacher, I have to remember all those things, not to offend anybody, and always remember if I'm expressing my views, which I try not to do, um, be sensitive to the affiliations of my audience members, what groups they belong to, and what faith, belief, and uh, cultural um, backgrounds they may have. The age of your listeners, younger listeners are likely to be open to new ideas although that's no guarantee and we cannot um, establish that it's not something that we can accept as a dogma older listeners are more conservative usually but not always again that is a, another stereotype against older people that they're conservative and this is very very dangerous to assume um, so we say younger people may be more flexible older people are more um, receptive to change more open to change and again that sounds as a stereotype and some people are there to challenge those stereotypes so you have to remember how to speak with people taking into account their predisposition their histories their cultures gender assumptions are very difficult to make uh, so avoid any language that specifies sex or that may sound as sexist and avoid stereotyping. It is funny because the authors of the, the book of the chapter are stereotyping people by, the, by their ages and not even, not even feeling bad about it. The level of education while you're in college and you know your classmates are about the same, especially that you have heard or viewed the, the videos of your classmates making their own introductions. Um, usually, you know, another stereotype, better educated means better informed, um, wider range of interests, more curious, open to new ideas, um, and accepting of change. Um, better educated people are ready to acknowledge alternative perspectives because that's usually what school does. Unless it is some dogmatic school where they attend, say, um, party-oriented, party-run schools in the former Soviet Union or schools in general in, in, in the Soviet Union, former socialist bloc sometimes or in you know in other countries where I'm speaking from my own experience that there was dogmatic thinking but we also knew how to read between the lines so the stereotype is that Soviet people are encased in stereotypical thinking uh, and we we are sometimes more open-minded because we had to struggle to gain our freedom of thought so you never know <clears throat> important group affiliations uh, what group people groups people belong to um, be it professional political religious or social you cannot assume that all people in your classroom or in your audience are rich or poor although i am f uh, pretty comfortable speaking to my students very often i tell them that i know none of us are extremely rich um taking the risk I acknowledge that there might be students sitting in my classroom who may come from a very rich family. 
But it is a very safe bet, knowing the background of our students at Oneonta, to say that usually these are middle class uh, individuals, middle class families, working families. Um, but I am running a certain risk saying that I know none of us is a millionaire. What if someone is, right? But I'm not doing or saying anything against those. Okay, so you need to be sensitive to people's background, social, ethnic, uh, cultural, all, all, uh, and um, uh, political affiliations, religion, their faith, and their profession. Say, you might look really silly if you're making a claim about some area of knowledge in which you're not an expert, but a member of your audience is. Say you're talking about um, medicine, about health, and one of your audience members is a professional physician, and you're saying something that is very um, shallow, unsupported, um, you might actually earn the resentment of that individual. So, sociocultural backgrounds include race, ethnicity, uh, part of the country where the person is from, uh, uh, and the type of place they grew up in, rural or urban. So, don't always make assumptions that people know certain things or they have certain things. Um, I'm um, often facing the assumption that I have grown up watching certain American TV shows, but... I tell my friends and my classmates, my colleagues, that when I was growing up back in Armenia, we did not watch I Love Lucy. I know what I Love Lucy is, but there are a lot of other programs that I haven't seen or heard about. And to make those assumptions that I grew up watching those cartoons, that is rude. That is actually rude, because I don't do that. I don't say, do you remember from your childhood watching Nupagadzi? Do you? No, you don't. But I do remember that. So being very sensitive to people's backgrounds, their culture, their, you know, their past, um, creates allies, not enemies. So the audience has its dynamics. Uh, people's attitudes can be written on their faces, their body language, their comments, their replicas. And, um, um, when I say replica, that's actually a Russian word. It means a comment. Uh, it doesn't mean a copy. Um, so people's attitudes, their beliefs, their values, their motivations, you know, what they're feeling, what are they here for? They came here to, to receive something specific. You need to be aware of that. And that is the dynamics of the audience. The motivation of your audience. Um, motivation moves people to action. Uh, directs them towards goals, it explains why people behave as they do, so you need to understand their motives if they react in a certain way or if they are in the room for a certain purpose, like you are here in this room, in this virtual room, for the purpose of learning. So your motivation is to gain knowledge. Your motivation is not to make a career move or to prove me wrong. Your motive is to learn. And I'm here. My motive is to help you learn. So there are some motives that you need to consider. Uh, people need to feel comfortable. They need to feel that they belong, that they, they're nurtured, that their traditions are respected and involved, um, that they're understood, recognized, that they're safe, independent, treated fairly. There is variety of, of viewpoints, their achievements and enjoyment is recognized so um, those those kind of motives you might actually consider why people come to listen to you what are they looking for in in your um, in your presentation so if you have a diverse audience it is a good thing it definitely is an enriching thing but it also creates certain challenges for the speaker um, you need to find shared values and build a common ground provide um, a lot of supporting material because bare facts, objective facts are easier to accept than opinion or politicized or faith-based or belief-based views. Um, emphasize the use of narratives because narratives are all universal. They're um, common for all humans and avoid linguistic problems. Don't use cultural references that you know some of your audience members will miss and feel excluded. 
Rhetorical landmines. R rhetorical landmines would include stereotypes, um, ethnocentrist statements, um, you know, calling everything and everyone American that is not not accurate. There are people from other countries. Steer clear of sexist language, as we mentioned before, and don't allow racism to intrude. Wow, easier said than done. Um, <laughs> I have to bring you an example of um, ethnocentric or the opposite of ethnocentric thinking or speaking. One day I was teaching a class in media and culture and I asked my students, who has traveled abroad? What countries have you visited? And at that moment, although I'm not American and my um, cultural background was made pretty obvious to my class, I was speaking from an ethnocentric perspective. And one of my students from China, you know, a very um, humorous person, a very smart individual, raised his hand. And when I asked him to mention the countries that he has visited, he stood up and said, America. So that is the opposite of ethnocentrism coming from him. <laughs> but on my behalf, on my part, it was ethnocentric questioning. Where have you been outside of the United States? Well, for me as well, the United States was a foreign country until 1995. So how do we avoid sexist and racist language? First of all, do we don't use slang to refer to different groups. We avoid using the male pronoun he um, to generic situations where we're unsure of the gender of the person. Um, avoiding stereotypes that imply inferiority and avoid from sexist, racist, ethnic or religious humor. That is to say no blonde jokes. Um, that in itself is really sexist and bringing up humor even for the sake of a laugh that is not funny to people who belong to the group that is being ridiculed so adapting to every situation that you're handed adapt to the time uh, time and place of, of your speech the occasion the size of the audience and the context of your speech um, because not everything works the same way when the audience members are tired or um, if it's late at night you know making a long speech a cheerful speech late at night wouldn't work the place dictates the tone the occasion if you're making a eulogy it's one thing when you're making a toast on a wedding uh, occasion it's another one and the audience size of course if you're speaking to a huge audience it requires a bigger effort um, acknowledgement of the size of the audience. So those are some of the things that you want to remember to adapt to the situation and this concludes our conversation about chapter 5.